Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, New York Community Bank, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Collier's International NYC, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringhoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Brooklyn, New York. Yes, Staten Island. Public school. St. John's, but in Staten Island. Northfield Federal Banking? Nah, maybe I'll go to graduate school. Harvard? Nah, maybe Columbia. Columbia, part-time business when I'm in, in graduate school? I have a great little business over here. Oh, maybe I'll do something else. Chemical Bank, Chemical Bank, going to go out on my own. Credit Suisse First Boston, Cantor Fitzgerald, the president of NKF Capital Markets, right? Yes. Anthony Orso, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So let's talk about your mother's side first and then your father's side. Well, it's a great story. My mom grew up in Sicily. She came from a very successful family. My uh, grandfather was an actual artist in painter, Sicily, right? a painter in Agrigento. And her mom decided that she wanted to move to the United States, so they packed them up and moved. My mom got to uh, New York. She actually got to Buffalo because they had some family there. And she went from a beautiful seaside community in Sicily to the cold in Buffalo. So you can imagine a 19, 20 year old girl who can't speak a lick of English going to Buffalo. Yeah, but you said to me your mother was an Olympiad, a discus. My mom had a great life in Sicily. She was a beauty queen at, uh, contestant at 16 and she made the Italian Olympics at 17 as a discus thrower. Her parents uh, didn't allow her to compete in the Olympics so she could only compete in the uh, in the Italian Olympics in Rome, but uh, she qualified. So when did they come over to Buffalo? Oh, my mom was around uh, 20 years old, so um, it was um, the, uh, my mom was born in 1934, so that was, uh, I think it was 1954, she came over. My mom died about a year ago, and up until, you know, her last day, she always said she never understood why her family took her away from such a storied life to come to Buffalo. Tell me about Dad's side, because there was a farm and there were others. Tell yeah, my, my dad uh, was born for two, um, two, his parents were from Naples. Uh, my dad was born in Brooklyn, but my dad grew up in a farm in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn. That's right. Which we, I don't think people can imagine right, a, it, a Brooklyn it, farm. I mean, it's crazy, it, it right? They had cows. Okay. Cows, they, they grew things, and, and um, you know, he was, uh, he was out every morning on the farm. Uh, worked real hard. My grandfather was really tough, 
and uh, they had a big family. All the family lived near each other. Wait, the, Bay 32nd Street? Well, they moved to Bay 32nd Street from Flatbush. That was, uh, that was uh, later in life, and uh, it's actually how my parents met. When uh, my mom's family moved from Buffalo to Brooklyn, they were looking to buy a house, but they rented first, and they moved in an apartment where my, my father lived on the first floor with his family, and my grandparents and my mom and her two sisters moved on the second floor. And that's how my parents met. So, but is this after your father came back from the Marines? Came back from the Marines. My grandfather had gotten sick. My father came back, uh, helped take care of the family. He had a big, uh, he had a lot of uh, siblings and uh, he was, uh, he became a mason and a bricklayer and supported the family. Um, worked hard, worked, um, you know, during the week and always on the weekends. And that tradition continued as I was a small kid and uh, as I grew up in high school. So. Mom and Dad lived in the same building. Same house. Same house. They get married in what year? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so my mom was 25, so, so, so that was, she was born in 34. 59. 59. Did. Okay, so at that time, uh, was Dad still on the farm or was he working? My, my dad at that point was now a full-fledged mason and bricklayer, and he was working uh, mostly throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn. Now, and Grandpa... The artist was here right now. Artist was here, moved um, to um, uh, Bensonhurst. They bought a, bought a house, and, uh, the re and my mom's family all moved there. My mom and dad get married. They moved to the third floor of that same house that his parents owned. Um, so it's interesting, and that tradition of all families staying together. Two families staying together. Well, really, really, if you think about it, his siblings also lived on the same block. So everyone lived together. It was we easy for the Sunday uh, meal. Every Sunday meal, as I remember, up until about 13 or 14, we ate at either my parents' house or one of my aunts or uncle's house every Sunday. Now, Grandpa on Mom's side became a commercial painter, you said. Became a commercial painter, uh, which again, if you think about it, uh, gave up a lot to come to this country. Because he was a great painter. Yes, he really was, and, and um, you know, became a commercial painter here. So when I think about my roots in real estate, you know, really starts from my father as a, as a bricklayer and mason and my grandfather as a painter, a commercial painter. So at the age of three, your parents decided to move to Staten Island. It's a big move. The bridge hadn't gotten built yet, and my father ventured out of Brooklyn to Staten Island. He, he got there before the bridge? Before the bridge. Okay. Did you ever ask your mom and dad how, why they decided to move to Staten Island at that uh, it was all Before my, the bridge. I it mean. was all my dad. My dad thought... Um, at some point, the bridge will get done, the bridge was under construction, and values in real estate will skyrocket. So um, I'm not sure that really happened the way he thought, but we, we bought, or they bought, an old house, an old three-story house, which I think we probably spent 20 years rebuilding. So you're three years of age when you moved mm -hmm. to Staten Island, and so tell me about growing up before you became a laborer at the age of 12? Well, Staten Island was, at the time, a very blue-collar, middle-class, working-class uh, neighborhood in Duncan Hills, where I grew up right near the bridge. And everybody worked, and everybody worked hard, and kids were expected to do well in school and keep out of trouble, both of which I had some problems uh, keeping up with. My sister was a great student. My younger brother was a great student. I was a smart kid, but I had other priorities, and school wasn't necessarily at the top of my priorities. Now, you said to me, I think, originally you did newspapers? Oh, I, I did all kinds of things as a kid. Um, I was involved in newspapers. I was, in, I was always involved in selling something. And, and whatever I could get my hands so what on. What were you selling? Oh, I, I sold magazines. I, uh, had a, we had a neighbor that, um, that uh, bought a house, and there was tons of old magazines there, and I would sell them, resell them to people, you know, 25 cents. I got them for nothing, so I could sell them for 25 or 50 cents a piece. They were old, you know, National Geographic and Time Life, all really classic magazines that were in the basement of this house that he bought, and I spent two years selling them. So besides that, so when do you get on the... Uh your first uh, labor work? Well, I think the first time I actually, helping uh, my father on a job site, I was probably six or seven. 
but the first documented, um, uh, and I say this because we, 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 we built a, a, a deck, a concrete deck, and I was pushing a wheelbarrow and we put the initials in and the dates. So I was 12, it was the summer of 12, and I guess I had the, the ability to push a wheelbarrow full of cement at 12, which uh, meant that they made me do it. My brother, who was uh, younger than I, um, who was a very smart kid, they always said his hands were too soft to push cement, so he would do all the intellectual things. He might run the wiring if they were doing an electric job. He turned out to be a rocket scientist that went to MIT, so they probably knew something early on that I didn't know. Uh, but uh, I, I started at 12 on a job site, and really throughout um, my junior high school, high school, and really even through college and even past college, I worked on weekends with my dad and uh, both at our house and on side jobs and, you know, during the summers. Now, now you said to me you, you did well in high school, right? Well, you know, there was a defining moment for me when I was, um, it was going into my junior year in high school, and I was always in the, in the smart classes, but I was always looking for the easy way out so I could focus on other things. And so I was uh, 16 going into uh, junior year, and my father said, look, if you don't care much about school, it doesn't matter. There's always a spot for you here on the job site. That was like a lightning bolt. Like, I thought, wait a second, I, I, I can't do this forever. It's too hard. Like, I couldn't understand how my father and all the people that he worked with did it, but I knew I couldn't do it. So I remember thinking, I, I got to make a change. So going into 11th grade, um, I worked real hard, and between 11th and 12th grade, you know, I got basically straight A's, and I realized, hey, I have to go to college. And you graduated number one in high school, right? I graduated number one in college. Okay. So but, uh, but I didn't even think about going to college until really 11th grade. I, no one in my family had gone to college yet, um, so I didn't, there wasn't really much thought about it. So yeah. how did you decide to stay on the island and go to St. John's? And um, the it was uh, easy. Um, they let me in, which was nice. Um, I could commute back and forth from home. You know, I had to pay for my own way. And it was just, um, it was just really, I didn't even think of many other options. So how did you get the job working for the Northfield Bank? They, you know, was on campus recruiting. I thought I'd be, I thought I was going to go in and, and get a job as a teller. And thankfully, uh, somebody thought I'd maybe have some sales skills. So they, Because you were selling the magazines. Right? Well, I'd always been selling. You know, I had a life of selling, you know, and, and, and I always felt comfortable asking people to give me money. So, you know, that, that skill set, as it turns out, when you work at a bank and you're asking people to open up at accounts, that actually worked out pretty well. So I spent uh, four years working uh, at a bank in Staten Island. It was a great experience. Uh, lots of friends learned, started to learn a little bit about what it really means to, to, to run it and, and work at a bank, and, and that was good experience. And, and you know, it was, uh, you know, I wasn't pushing a wheelbarrow. Tell me about the story about the money that your father said if you did well in school. Well, so I get to St. John's, and, and, I, and I, I knew that I had to work hard in order to get good grades, and I knew that I had to think about what I was gonna do now. And I always felt I was behind because I didn't think much about school until I was really in the 11th grade. So, go, you know, my first year I did pretty well, and uh, it was the summer of my first year. I was working at the bank, still helping my dad on the weekends. And my dad said to me in August, hey, if you get all straight A's your next semester, I'll give you 500 bucks. Now, I thought 500 bucks back then, that sounded like all the money in the world. Um, I was uh, just turned 19, and um, so I start that semester, and I said, okay, I'm going to work even harder than I'd worked in the past. And it was a great semester. I get my report, I get my, my grades at the end of the, of the semester, and I get four A's and a B plus. And I thought, well, that's not possible. Can't fall short. So I tracked down the professor that gave me the B plus, who had already left for vacation, and I catch him on vacation, and... He doesn't understand why it was so critical that I speak to him. And I said, I think there was a mistake. You know, I got a B plus. I really think you may want to go back and check my grades. And my, my last, uh, 
you know, uh, final and, uh, and the paper that I submitted. And, and he said, well, what are you talking about? I already came to that decision. I said, no, no, I need you to reevaluate. It's critical. So P.S., I hounded him for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally, I get a note in the mail that they changed my grade, so and I got, got the five A's. the $500. I got the 500 bucks, so okay. that was, uh, was a big deal for me. So you graduated St. John's when? I graduated St. John's in uh, 1985. And then what happens? What do you decide? Well, um, again, I, I really thought my plan was I wanted to go to law school because sort of in, in, in Staten Island, you either wanted to be a lawyer or you wanted to be a doctor or you wanted to be a mobster. So the last option certainly wasn't on the table for me. So Even though you live near the mobsters. Lots of mobsters around us and you know, lots of influence. But I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor, but I thought I'm a good enough talker possibly to be a lawyer. So in my mind, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to do well in college. I'm going to take some time off, make some money, and then go to law school. And that was my plan. So... I graduate and I take a job in the construction management side of the World Financial Center. Working for Merrill Lynch. For Merrill Lynch, uh, building, uh, the two buildings down in the World Financial Center. And, and my job was getting coffee for the construction managers and counting screws and taking notes at construction meetings. And, and well, I wasn't getting paid much. What I did see is what it took to build, I think that was almost four million square feet. And it really took an army. And it took unbelievable coordination. This is before everyone had computers, obviously. And it was really very labor intensive to track the management of a project of that size. So I, I, thought, I thought it was fascinating. Um, I decided that uh, after the first year and watching how the business people interacted with the lawyers, I thought, you know, I think maybe I have a maybe I should be thinking about going to business school, not law school. And, and I remember telling my parents this, and, and they didn't even know what business school was. And I wasn't really sure I knew either. But I knew if you can get an MBA, maybe you can get a business job and not think about being a lawyer. So that's kind of what I decided to do. So you applied to Harvard. I had applied with one week left to Harvard Business School, and I figured, hey, well, they should definitely want to take me. Of course, they didn't. Um, and I said, okay, well, now I have to really think about applying. So I spent the following year um, preparing and, you know, taking, um, you know, the, the GMATs and, and really preparing to take and put together then serious you, Then essays. you got a job with Boston Properties. Well, I, get, I, I, I applied to business school. I applied to Wharton and Columbia. Um, I got into both. I decided to go to Columbia because I'm, I had really never left New York, still haven't born and raised in New York City, so I decided um, I wanted to stay in New York City. It was an unbelievable experience. Uh, first year of business school, as you know, I met my partner, Michael Learman, in orientation. Uh, L and O happened to be in the same orientation class. He looked right, I looked left. We've been partners ever since. Um, but, you know, the first year of business school, um, Columbia had a great real estate program, and I took a bunch of real estate finance classes. And I was lucky enough that summer to get a job at Boston Properties. But when did you and Michael start your little consulting business when you were at Columbia? Well, we were probably two weeks into school, and um, we didn't have any money. Um, and it was expensive, and, you know, um, we thought we needed to figure out how to make some money. We, we looked around, and what we realized is there was a lot of cheap labor, a lot of MBA students who weren't working. So... About two or three weeks into our first year of business school, we started a company called Re uh, Columbia Real Estate Associates. And it was a real estate consulting and valuation business. And Michael and I went out and found law firms that needed help. You at, were doing sales. We were doing sales. And, and then we, you had the labor. And we had the labor. We were paying uh, business school students 10 bucks an hour. We were generally charging between 50 and 100 bucks an hour. And, um, and that turned out to be a very successful two-year business while we were at school. And one summer, as I said, you went to work for Boston Properties. I, that, the first summer, I uh, got an internship, really very lucky, um, at Boston Properties um, in the New York City office at 599 Lexington. Okay. And you graduate, and you have the opportunity at Chemical Bank, right? I, um, I got lucky again, and I kind of think about 
if you're in the right place at the right time, sometimes you get lucky. I, uh, I had Joe DeLuca interview me, and I don't think there were many other Italians uh, that day uh, from business Bank school, also. and maybe not at Chemical at the time. He took a liking to me, um, so I got hired, and I, I was sort of shocked. I wasn't really sure what it meant to go work at a big commercial bank at the time. I think our group was 600 people. Um, and, and honestly, I didn't really know if I had the skill sets, and I wasn't really sure what they were going to ask me to do. So then after that, you and Michael decided to go back into business? Well, it's funny. Um, from, from that first few weeks of uh, business school, even throughout uh, my time at Chemical, we maintained this side business. We always had people working for us, and the same clients and the same law firms that were hiring us from the very beginning, continued to hire us throughout. And uh, So when did you start APC? So 1993, Michael and I decide to go into business full time together and basically step up what we had been doing on the consulting side into really an investment banking business where we were going to help at the time, as you recall, lots of properties were in distress. The RTC uh, mess had just sort of been finishing up and most people had a hard time refinancing their property. So what we focused on doing was helping developers access equity capital and then providing new financings for them. So we spent a long, long time. Actually, we had a 10 year run where we successfully ran our business. We had offices in New York, uh, Chicago, Dallas, San Francisco and LA. Uh, we had about 50 people working for us. We had a great time. We made a lot of money. We worked on lots of cool transactions. We worked with great developers across the country. And, and really, I, I never imagined not having our own business together. So 2002, you get a phone call from a guy named Steve Cantor. Yeah. Swiss first boss. Yeah, I remember. I was on vacation with my family. Um, we had just gotten cell phones. And uh, my assistant calls and says, hey, Steve Cantor just called looking for you. He wants to have lunch as soon as you're back. And I thought, wow, you know, Steve is, uh, was a big name in real estate. Uh, DLJ and Credit Suisse had just merged, and Steve was now running all of real estate. And, you know, I assumed the meeting was about us trying to help them find business, which I thought was great. So Subsequently, uh, you found that it was a job interview. Well, it was towards the end of a, about a two-and-a-half-hour lunch, and we talked about everything from business to, to the Mets. We're both big Mets fans kids, family, vacations. And at the end of lunch, he says, so what do you think? And I go, what do I think about what? He goes, well, what would you think about coming back to work at a Wall Street firm? And I go, what Wall Street firm? And he goes, well, what are you talking about? Come to CS. And I go, what are you, crazy? I, I'm not gonna, I, I, I have my own business. Wait a second, but you have, what happened to your partner? The well, well, by the way, at the end of lunch, I didn't even know what he was talking about. I, I, he says, no, 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 we're gonna need to get together again. I want you to seriously consider it. So as I'm leaving, I said, well, I can't have another meeting with you unless Michael comes. And he goes, I don't care. If you, that's fine. Let's get together, the three of us. So I, I leave lunch. I call Michael. I said, you're never going to believe this. I think I just got an interview. I just got interviewed. He said, interviewed for what? I said, to go work at Credit Suisse. He goes, are you crazy? I go, that's what I told Steve. I said, are you crazy? He said, no, no, I'm not crazy. So when do you and Michael go to Credit Suisse? So it's early 2002. We have a, a few meetings with Steve and, and Rob Brennan and a few of the other senior people at the bank. And uh, the truth was it was great timing. Early 2002, after 9-11, the, the capital markets were starting to rebuild. CS and DLJ had merged. It became an enormous powerhouse, particularly on the fixed income side. And really, they gave us an opportunity to come in and help them rebuild the business, which we did. And you rebuilt the business, large CMBS, securitizations, Time yeah. Warner Center. We, the, the first big deal we did um, was taking out the GMAC construction loan on the residential portion of Time Warner Center. And at the time, um, CMBS had never securitized condo conversion deals or new construction. So we did the first securitization of, of condos in the city, we ended up doing about 25 billion of that. Um, and again, I think about it, that first transaction, if you, if you think about early 2002, uh, the world didn't seem so great after 9-11. Right. No and question. certainly, and certainly there was a lot of doubt as to whether people would pay, you know, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 bucks a foot for condos in the city. In fact, people were talking about all moving. So you stay with Steve, 
till when? We left uh, CES at the, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2009. We had done about $200 billion of financing. We had built one of the top real estate finance businesses in the country. We had a great time. We had about 400 people. We had offices in about 20 different locations. Uh, we were doing CMBS. We were doing agency financing. And, and really, you know, if the market hadn't taken a turn, I think we would have all stayed much longer. When, when did you and Michael do the Bronx Terminal Market with Related? Well, Michael's family had owned the Bronx Terminal Market for many, many years, and uh, Michael and I convinced his grandfather, even though we had no money, to sell us the site. So he agreed to sell us the site. He knows we don't have the money, and then we embark upon finding a partner, and thankfully, Steve uh, Ross and Jeff Blau believed in us and the site. They uh, partnered with us in the early 2000s. We spent many years getting it demolished, going through EULA. It was a 10-year labor of love. We now have a million square foot shopping center with Related there that we've been operating successfully. They've been amazing partners, thankfully to Michael and his family or none of this would have happened. So it shows you sometimes looking right uh, makes a big difference Let's in the world. Let's talk about what happens with Howard Lutnick. So at the uh, end of 2009, uh, Michael and I leave CS, uh, Steve leaves CS, and Howard uh, starts calling Michael and myself and, and Steve and says, look, uh, as the big banks are pulling out of real estate, I think this is a perfect time for Canna Fitzgerald to get into the real estate market. And really, we went there without much of a business plan. We didn't really know exactly what we were going to do because at the end of 2009, no one knew what they were going to do, certainly in commercial real estate. So you go to Cantor and you start CCCR. We start our finance business called CCRE in 2010. We raise third party capital. The firm puts up a lot of capital and we be quickly become one of the largest non-bank real estate financing sources in the country. Talk about Newmark and then we'll go to the... Uh, in 2011, uh, uh, Cantor, uh, through its public company, BGC Partners, bought Newmark, and then shortly after we bought uh, Grubb and Ellis out of bankruptcy, and suddenly we had a big real estate finance business, and sitting next so on the side of us was a full-service brokerage firm, which is now almost 5,000 people, 150 offices, and, and certainly the fastest growing commercial services uh, business in the United States. And today your title is? Today I'm president of Capital Market Strategies at Newmark. I have the honor of working with Barry Gossin and Jimmy Kuhn, who have been friends of mine uh, for a long time and are certainly icons in this business. And, you know, we're really lucky. We're building a great capital markets business throughout the country. And, you know, I'm just uh, along for the ride and helping out. Family, the boys and you, your wife. Yeah, so I have three older boys. And Steven is 24, Michael 23, Alec, who's at NYU right now, is 19. And I have a three and a half year old princess named Ivy. and. She is the girliest girl that you've ever met. And what are the boys doing these days? Uh, my oldest son is in the music business. My middle son is in the venture capital world. And my youngest son is in the real estate school at NYU. And we have pictures of you and your wife. Now, my wife is from Wisconsin, so she's a massive Packer fan. I'm a big Cowboy fan, as most people know. So we, uh, we go to lots of games together. Unfortunately, the Packers usually win, so it usually works out better for her than me. And also, and the Mets are winning this season. Well, so we're, I'm a big Mets fan, as I said earlier. Uh, I think it's going to be a great year for us, and uh, hopefully uh, this is our year. So uh, I think it was fortuitous that Dad moved to Staten Island. And it helped you learn a little bit about real estate, and you've become an uh, icon in real estate. And thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.